You're listening to the expository preaching ministry of Kootenai Community Church, located in Kootenai, Idaho. We pray that Christ is exalted and your spirit is blessed by the teaching of God's Word. For more information about Kootenai Church, please visit us online at kootenaichurch.org. Have you ever been called a fool? <laughs> There's a good reason to be a fool. And we're going to look at that a little bit at that today. So let's open in prayer. Father, we thank you this morning for your word. We thank you for it every day. We thank you especially for it as we are able to dig into it and delight at what you have done for us and what you intend to do through us. Lord, we pray this morning as you as you teach us through your Holy Spirit that we would be open and ready to be obedient as Paul was, even to near death. All the things that happened to him, we look at them and we marvel at that. And we understand that, that uh, you can work, you can use, and you can bless. And so we want to be part of that every day. Well, thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, <clears throat> Last week, we finished up with the Corinthians being pretty prideful. Seems like that is the theme, and it will be the theme throughout this book. The, the, the most difficult of human maladies, if you will. Sins. Maladies is, maladies is too easy a word. Is pride. Ego. I'm better than you. I have something you don't have. And the Corinthians were already filled, Paul said. They were already rich. They were kings without them. They were this, they were that. They were perfect. They were wonderful. They were fabulous. They, and they knew it. And they bragged about it. And he said, we were condemned to death. We were the triumph. We were the, the people in chains in the march of triumph of the Roman general. As he displayed the wares of his conquering, his conquering army. They were spectacles, both to angels and to men. And the Corinthians, as this one commentator pointed out in their pride, actually some commentators believe that, that it was, Paul was talking about the Corinthians and their pride were acting like the conquering general, displaying the trophies of their prowess. And the apostles were the little group of men doomed to die. To the Corinthians, the Christian life meant flaunting their pride and their privileges. And reckoning up their achievement to Paul, it meant humble service, ready to die for Christ. And he was willing to do that. And, and I believe if I remember right, I got some of that in here. We'll see that, that he was, he was pretty well abused and misused. It's one thing to be abused and misused by the world. It's another when fellow Christians do it, isn't it? It's, it's almost, I won't say unbearable, but it is, it can be tremendously disheartening. And, so remember, that's what Paul's up against here. The church that he founded, the church that he, quote, fathered, unquote, if you will, was misusing him, if you will. Let's open chapter 4, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, and we'll, um, we'll read that chapter again to continue to maintain context. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Let a man regard us in this manner as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. In this case, moreover, it is required of stewards that one be found trustworthy. But to me, it is a very small thing that I should be examined by you or by any human court. In fact, I do not even examine myself, for I am conscious of nothing against myself. Yet I am not by this acquitted, but the one who examines me is the Lord. Therefore, do not go on passing judgment before the time, but wait until the Lord comes, who will bring both who will both bring to light the things hidden in the darkness and disclose the motives of men's hearts. And then each man's praise will come to him from God. Now, these things, brethren, I have figuratively applied to myself and Apollos for your sakes, that in us you might learn not to exceed what is written in order that no one of you might become arrogant in behalf of one against the other. For who regards you as superior? And what do you have that you did not receive? But if you did receive it, why do you boast as if you had not received it? You are already filled. You have already become rich. You have become kings without us. And I would indeed that you had become kings so that we might also reign with you. For 
I think God has exhibited us apostles, last of all, as men condemned to death because we have become a spectacle to the world, both to angels and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but you are prudent in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are distinguished, but we are without honor. To this present hour, we are both hungry and thirsty and are poorly clothed and are roughly treated and are homeless. And we toil, working with our own hands. When we are reviled, we bless. When we are persecuted, we endure. When we are slandered, we try to conciliate. We have become as the scum of the world, the dregs of all things, even until now. I do not write these things to shame you, but to admonish you as my beloved children. For if you were to have countless tutors in Christ, yet you would not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I became your father through the gospel. I exhort you, therefore, be imitators of me. For this reason, I have sent to you Timothy, who is my beloved and faithful child in the Lord. And he will remind you of my ways, which are in Christ, just as I teach everywhere in every church. Now, some have become arrogant as though I were not coming to you, but I will come to you soon. If the Lord wills, and I shall find out not the words of those who are arrogant, but their power. For the kingdom of God does not consist in words, but in power. What do you desire? Shall I come to you with a rod or with love and a spirit of gentleness? So Paul is going to be ramping up in this chapter to to these words in the end of this chapter. Where it's going to hopefully become more and more evident to the Corinthians that their behavior has resulted in such great concern to the man who founded the church, who, who was their father in the gospel. And he does say that he doesn't, he's not trying to shame them, but and I don't want to get ahead of myself, but these are things that Christians should be ashamed of if they're operating in pride, if they're operating in one-upmanship, if, if they're afraid to be known as Christians, if they're concerned about the wrong kinds of things. And and Paul is going to deal with that as the as the book as we get deeper and deeper into this book. Now whenever you're dealing with a corrective and and you spend lots of time on the the reasons for the corrective, it can sound like just a bash fest on certain people. And I don't want us to think that that's what's going on here. Paul needs to make sure that the Corinthians understand the depth of what it is that they're doing that is disheartening to him, that is unchristlike, And he comes at it from every angle and he does it under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit so that it is done perfectly. And we would do well to take heed to how he does this. He is not delighted that he has to do this. <laughs> I've got another bad church I can beat up. What a bunch of dorks. No, he's he's disheartened. These are people that should by now be an example to the city of Corinth. Well, they're an example, all right. It's just the wrong kind of example. They're the kind of example where people would say, well, if that's what it's like being a Christian, I don't want to have anything to do with it. And that shouldn't be. That should never be. So Paul is communicating to them that in their, in their effort to avoid the things that Christians should be doing, They're demonstrating to the world something. They're demonstrating to one another something. But more importantly, they're not giving God any glory. And so Paul, he uses some interesting words here now. In verse 10, we finished up last week with verse 9. For I think God has exhibited us apostles last of all as men condemned to death because we have become a spectacle to the world, both to angels, to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, he says. But you are prudent in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. We are dis- you are distinguished, but we are without honor. Continuing with this sarcastic and, and ironic tone, Paul makes a series of comparisons now. He says that the, the apostles are fools. We, he says, are fools. And he uses the Greek word that forms the basis for the word we have, that we use, called, which is the word for moron. We are morons, he says. Compared to the Corinthians who were wise and intelligent. Intelligent. He says the apostles are infirm and feeble compared to the mighty Corinthians who were wise and intelligent. They were of high esteem. The Corinthians were of high esteem, Paul says. But the apostles are base and dishonored. Imagine being, 
having that kind of a comparison made between yourself and someone to whom you know is a great person. The Corinthians still honored the world's wisdom and they wanted to be well thought of. Paul is trying to show them, as we need to know, that servants of Christ will never be well thought of by the world. Get over it. It's what he says, basically. The true servants of Christ will never be thought well of by the world. Now, that doesn't mean we have to try not to be well thought of. Some of us have that as a natural talent, I would say, myself included. But it does say that as we truly live out the gospel, the world is not going to like it. Expect that. Some of their philosophers had already called Paul a babbler and a proclaimer of strange deities. In Acts chapter 17, the uh, Epicurean, it says, and also, verse 18, and also some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers were conversing with him. Some were saying, what would this idle babbler wish to say? Others, he seems to be a proclaimer of strange deities. Why? Because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. Remember another place where he says, I would know nothing but the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Yes. 1718. I like those references. They're easy to remember. Just have to know how to count. <laughs> Pardon? Oops. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oops. So they, uh, the world was already clearly denigrating, if you will, Paul and, and disliking him and uh, making fun of him. But. So were the Corinthians to some degree. So, any comments on verse 10? The fools for Christ's sake. It's okay to be the right kind of fool. The kind of fool who is unashamed of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Who is happy with what the Lord has allotted them in life. Who is delighted to be a follower of the Son of God. Yes. No. A jerk is a jerk whether you got the word Christian attached to it or not. You can be a a worldly jerk and you can be a Christian jerk. <laughs> That's probably not. Maybe that doesn't always go together. You follow what I'm saying? No. As we humbly, politely, kindly, beneficially live out the gospel, there will be those that God is drawing. We don't know who they are. We become aware of it maybe by God's grace as they come to us. But there will be those of the elect that God is drawing that we will have a certain kind of good effect on by God's grace. But there will be those, as you live it out properly, who are going to hate you for it. It's just the way it is. So, don't try to make people hate you. <laughs> it is, I guess is kind of what you're saying. Don't be a buffoon about your Christianity. Don't be smart aleck about your Christianity. Just be, as the Gospel calls us, Paul says, um, not arrogant, not overbearing, but kind, careful, considerate. Now, there's a lot more to it than that. That doesn't necessarily mean you paint a welcome sign on your back and say, please wipe your feet here if you have no other place to wipe them. But you don't go out of your way. You don't go out of your way to be arrogant. Those kinds of things. Yeah, yeah. It, it's, it's, the gospel isn't intuitive. That's why we have the Holy Spirit. Well, that sounds awful pragmatic. Um, the Holy Spirit is, He is the agent, the one that God uses to cause the gospel to be lived out in our lives. It's not intuitive. It doesn't come naturally. Does it come naturally to you? To just to be the way Jesus was, was on this earth? No, me neither. But it can be so that we become fools for Christ's sake. Because we become, and, and you're going to see Paul, Paul talks more about this later on. We become the agents Trying to come up with a good word, but the agents, I will use that now, of God's grace to other people. Ambassadors, thank you. The ambassador, good word. Can I use that? Can I quote you? Ron, I'll put another. Am, ambassadors for Christ. Ambassadors. And what does an ambassador do? He's pretty diplomatic. That's why they call him diplomats. And that is part of what we're called to do. And when they were calling Paul these names, we'll find out a few verses along here what he would do about that. So then he says this in verse 11. To this present hour, talking about himself, we are both hungry and thirsty and are poorly clothed and are roughly treated and homeless. We are homeless, he says. Even though this verse 
doesn't have the back and forth that the previous verse does. A contrast is assumed. The Corinthians are full and satisfied, while the apostles are hungry and thirsty. The Corinthians have good clothing and all their needs attended to. The apostles are poorly clothed and treated very poorly. The word translated poorly treated actually means treated violently uh, and comes from a root word which means to be struck with a fist. Remember, Paul was he was he was stoned. He was left for dead. He was whipped. He was all kinds of things were done to him because of his Christianity. The Corinthians had to know how the apostles had been treated. They had to know that Paul would have that would have been part of his preaching as he brought the gospel to Corinth earlier years, the, the years before. He wouldn't have kept that a secret. He would, have, he would have told them about the things that happened to him as he preached the gospel. Uh, uh, it's a full dis- Christianity is a full disclosure thing. You know, you don't hide stuff. Well, you're going to be loved. And if you, well, actually, people do that. Now that I correct myself, if you just follow the things that the Lord wants you to follow, you'll be healthy, wealthy, and wise. You'll have gulf streams and new shoes all the time. Send money to me. That, unfortunately, is the attitude that comes out of this. They had to know how the apostles were treated, whether they were in Rome, Ephesus, or Lystra, or any of the other places where they were driven out of. They were stoned. They were heckled. They were mistreated. The word had certainly gotten back to the Corinthians about what had happened. And it appears that they wanted to avoid that at all costs. Um, Later, in 2 Corinthians, Paul details to the Corinthians some of the things that happened to him. He's talking about other people. He says, are they servants of Christ? I speak as if insane. I more so. In far more labors, in far more imprisonments, beaten times without number. Times without number. We're only told of a couple of times. Apparently, Paul was beaten a lot more and it just the Holy Spirit didn't instruct him to write all of them down. Beaten times without number, often in danger of death. Five times I received from the Jews 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned, three times I was shipwrecked, a night and a day I have spent in the deep. I have been on frequent journeys, dangerous from rivers, dangerous from robbers, dangerous from my countrymen, dangerous from the Gentiles, dangerous in the city, dangerous in the wilderness, dangerous on the sea, dangerous among false brethren. False brethren, the harder one to take. I have been in labor and hardship through many sleepless nights, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure, apart from such external things, there is the daily pressure on me of concern for all the churches. Wow, what a recruiting speech. Sign me up, Ron says. Sign me up. Christianity is a full disclosure lifestyle. God doesn't hide anything. He tells us right at the outset, um, it will not be unicorns and roses. And you know what? Paul has been telling that to the Corinthians. They don't want that. And I'm going to introduce you to a new song later on, at least the first line of a new song that kind of captures that with, with apologies to George Beverly Shea. Any comments on verse 11 besides sign me up? Verse 12. Again, here's more of his, his uh, recruiting speech. And we toil, working with our own hands. Do you hear that, televangelist? Working with our own hands. When we are reviled, we bless. When we are persecuted, we endure. This is the calling that Paul had. While the Corinthian attitude would have been one for disdain for anyone who would work with their own hands or do any kind of physical labor because that type of thing was done by slaves. That was what slaves did. The apostles were willing to do whatever was necessary to fund the preaching of the gospel. While the Greek philosophies of the day were remarkable in their witticisms and their ability to give back what was taken, what was given to them, especially in unkindness, the apostles would bless people when they were reviled by them. Now, is that easy? It's, I'm going to use the vernacular of the day. It's like, dude, I mean, it's impossible. Without the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, we would do the same. I would do the same thing. And I, I, that's why I have a bloody tongue a lot. Shut up. While the Corinthians may have been moved to fight back when they were persecuted, if indeed they ever were, the apostles said they would endure. Paul says we would endure. The silly materialistic view that if they were successful, that they were successful, well-fed, fashionably clothed, 
housed in distinctive dwellings, wise, strong, and revered, was so important to them that Paul had to deal with it in this sarcastic and ironic way. Unfortunately, that view has plagued the church all down through the ages. And there are many who would be viewed by the world as successful. They want to be viewed by the world as successful. One commentator said this, Today the church is heavy with the same attitude of the Corinthian Christians. They were concerned about the image of worldly success and power. And many of them despised Paul and the other apostles because they did not display that image. Today there is no shortage of ministers who want to display the image of worldly success and power and no shortage of Christians who will value that in their minister. They want the ear tickling. They want the message that if you just do this, this, and this, your life will be so easy, you'll sail right on through it and everything will be wonderful. Flowers and roses and and you name it. Has anybody in here ever experienced that? And secondly, are we supposed to base our ex- things on our experience anyway? This is what Paul says. It's almost like he's trying to scare you off. You want to be a Christian? Here's what's going to happen. It's going to be just south of dying every day. You know, that isn't what he says. But God is not one to hide the truth from his, his children. Anyway. Indeed, and today, in many places, it's taught that if you have proper biblical faith, if you have proper biblical faith, you will be healthy, wealthy, and wise. And then I have written down here, see verse 9. For I think God has exhibited us apostles last of all as men condemned to death because we have become a spectacle to the world, both to angels and to men. Ron. (laughs) The litmus test is (laughs) how many scars you have. I think every believer is an individual. And God will use, he'll take some people that he'll bring through this life in relative ease who will be dynamic witnesses for him. And he'll have some that he'll bring through this life who will have a mixture of ease and pain. And they'll be, by his grace, dynamic witnesses for him. And he'll bring some through this life who have nothing but what seems like the most difficult life that one could imagine. And they'll be dynamic witnesses for him. Romans chapter 9 clears that up for us. If he wants to shape us as vessels, he's going to use us the way he chooses us. The key is that he is the vessel shaper and we say, yes, Lord. And that's the hard part. So, no, I don't think that 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 was a politician's answer using a paragraph when a sentence would have been would have done. The correct answer to that is, Ron, no. Um, Some people are going to have more stripes than others. Paul had more than. I don't know we, what we hear about Timothy. It sounds like Timothy had trouble, but it doesn't sound like he was beaten nine times and beaten with rods and let down over. A, does that mean Timothy wasn't as good a Christian as Paul? And we're not to compare ourselves, please. But, but using that vernacular right now, no. It means God had a different use, a different purpose, a different, a different direction for him. Timothy was one of Paul's best troubleshooters. At any rate, I don't want to get too far into this, but does that help? Yeah. No. Don't use the, the litmus test is Scripture. What does Scripture say? Now, there's going to be some of his servants that are going to be beaten regularly and some that aren't. Doesn't sound like Apollos was. It's going to be interesting to find out when we get there. So, what was it like? And some of them, I, I don't know, in heaven, there'll be no more tears. That'll all be wiped away. But I think when we hear the stories of some of what some folks went through, we're going to just have a, an, a heavenly wince. Wow. And others will just say, yeah, you know, I haven't. If, if that's true, I, I got problems because I don't have that much da- damage in my life. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> no. God's work will be done in God's way, in God's time, and with God's difficulties. I, I don't know how else to word it. Um, the things that, that some of us do, some may go along sailingly. I just, when that happens, I get on my knees and say, thank you, Lord. That was wonderful. And when things don't go along sailingly, well, I would, I would, I would venture to guess that the ordeal is both for the person I'm helping and for me, too. And John MacArthur ever always said, don't let a good catastrophe go, go to waste. <laughs> Find out what the catastrophe is doing 
Why? How can I deal? How can I respond properly to this? Find a biblical method by God's grace of how to respond to the difficulties. Yes. And what does God build in you when that happens? Confidence in Him. It would be nice if, if we just had a biblical solid confidence all the time. But it's just the way, of, the way we're built. When God brings us through a difficult time, it builds new confidence in us. Oh, yeah. The Scripture says He can handle anything. But I saw it happen. Don't use your experience. Let your experience be a glory to Him. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, we're not going to talk about Job today. I was having a nice day until you said that. Any other comments on, on verse 12? And, 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 and notice this. Now, I'm grateful that we are in a position in modern American churches where we can support a pastor. But any guy who gets to the place where he says, I don't need to be doing the toil of the church. I'm the Get rid of him. And hurt him doing it. No, I'm just kidding. I didn't say that. I didn't say that. Can you edit that out? Okay, good. We toil with our hands, Paul says. We toil, working with our hands, and when we are reviled, we bless. There's something about good, good old-fashioned, honest labor that should always be a part of the ministry of God in the hearts of the men and women that are doing it. If I won't clean the toilet, why would I expect somebody else to do it? You know? And if I ever get to a place where I won't clean the toilet, I hope it's because I can't walk. And that's the only reason. Just, we toil working with our hands, Paul said. It's a good thing to remember. It's a good thing to think about when we look at those who are supposed to be in positions of responsibility. When we are slandered, he says, we try to conciliate. <clears throat> we have become as the scum of the world, the dregs of all things, even until now. This brings up an interesting practice that the Greek world had that was kind of horrifying. When a Greek was slandered, and we'll get to that. When a Greek was slandered, he'd give it right back. Oh, yeah. He was a Winston Churchill of the day. They thought it was weak when pushed not to push back, not to fight back. Paul alludes to some ancient Greek practices here that, as I, I mentioned, were pretty alarming. He calls himself and the other apostles... The scum of the world and the dregs of all things. The King James uses the word off-scouring, which is actually a pretty good word um, once you look it up. It refers to the ancient Greek practice. Now, get this. This is the ancient Greek practice of casting certain worthless people into the sea during a time of plague or famine while saying, be our off-scouring. The thought was that the victims were called scrapings. The victims were scrapings in the belief that by getting rid of them, it would get rid of whatever community guilt had brought on this calamity. So guess who gets to be the off-scourings in the Greek world and in the Roman world? The Christians. They get burned on the, at the stake, burned on the crosses, cast into the ocean, cast into dungeon, fed the lions. Part of it was to get rid of the calamity that had struck. It, and it was just pure superstition. Pure superstition. The contrast couldn't be more stark. The Corinthians were the find upstanding members of society. The apostles were criminals, felons, unable to get work. They were homeless, living on park benches, covered with newspapers, if placed in the modern scene. The Corinthians would get along just fine, thank you very much, as long as they kept the gospel to themselves and functioned as good, as good Greek citizens would function, doing the same things that everyone around them did. Keep the light on. Don't shine it on me. I like my house. I like my job. This is not calling the Corinthians nor us to be arrogant, brazen, unkind, vicious, intolerant, wicked, and overbearing in preaching the gospel or stupid. It is calling us to live it every day, unafraid, joyful, careful, but knowing that the gospel still will be offensive to the world. The real gospel will always be offensive to the world. That's just how it is and how it always will be, Paul is telling the Corinthians. When they were slandered, and defamed in a foul mouth. And that's what the word means. They were cussed at is what it means. They were. And I hear. I mean. I, I must be getting old. But there was a time when the words that I hear in my store every day now. Were only spoken in the lunchroom at the mills that I worked at. And only 
pardon me for being weird like this, but only if there weren't any women present. Now, I've got this one customer that comes into my store, and I don't think he knows any other words. And, and I, I actually find myself wincing when he talks, and I'm thinking, maybe that'll have an effect on him. Those are the words that Paul's talking about. They would use a foul mouth, vituperative, unkind, arrogant, dirty words to talk about them. And the, what, did, what did the apostles do? They would come alongside to try and calm and conciliate the person. So I read this after I made my faces at this guy. I thought, oh, I really handled that well, didn't I? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be, by God's grace, thinking about a way to help this young fellow because... It even startles some of my other customers. They're going, you know, probably people my age. They, the apostles, would entreat these people and be kind. It's the same word used of the Holy Spirit, parakaleos, who comes alongside of us and is our helper. Not that we can ever be the Holy Spirit. Far be it from me from saying that. But Paul is saying when they would treat us this way, we'd come alongside them and try and calm them down and encourage them and conciliate them. The gospel way, as I mentioned earlier, is the opposite of the way of the world. And for Christians, it's even not really intuitive. It becomes more intuitive as God lives it out in our lives through the Holy Spirit. But to start with, what's your first thought when someone cusses at you? I don't want to know. Don't, don't say. Because then I'll have to tell you what my first thought is. <laughs> but usually it isn't to go, oh, you poor, unfortunate What's up in your life? How can I help? And you're usually it's to go, <laughs> first liar doesn't have a chance. You're dead meat. It must be done. The, the gospel must be lived out through us by the Holy Spirit himself. If we are, as the Corinthians, focused on the comforts of the world and the adulation of our acquaintances, it is very likely we will take the path the Corinthians took. One, one modern commentator had this very astute observation as I was reading through some of his, some of his words. He said this, It's a little embarrassing to read Paul's description of his ministry while working on a nice computer and surrounded by several hundred books and especially knowing how much I'd like to have the respect and admiration of the world. This is a a well-known, good commentator. After all, think of Paul's resume. Here's Paul's resume. Bounced from church to church, run out of many towns, accused of starting riots, rarely supported by ministry, arrested and imprisoned several times. Who wants to hire him? Our problem is we often want a middle road, a little popularity, a little reputation, but still the anointing of God. We want the power without the cost. God help us to choose Paul's way, he said. Oh, actually, I had that before us. <laughs> a little embarrassing. And I can, as I was reading that, I was going, yeah, I looked up. I'm in front of a computer. I've got books all around me. A messy office. There's my cross to bear. A messy office. Books all around me. Heater. air. Well, I don't have air conditioning, but I'm working on that. At any rate, Paul was bounced from church to church, run out of town, accused of starting. Can you imagine getting a job with a resume like that? Probably pretty difficult. So this is not to say we should run out and give all of our clothes away, our vehicles and our homes, strip off our good clothing, and put on rags and go to sleep in the park tonight while passing out tracks. But it is to say that if those things stand in the way of us living our lives for the Lord Jesus Christ, well then, maybe they do need to go. This was the dilemma of the rich young ruler. And Jesus saw right through it to the heart of his problem. It's the problem of the Corinthians and all down through the ages. Those who would rather not have Jesus, if it includes difficulty. Unfortunately, the George Beverly Shea song becomes, I'd rather not have Jesus, but silver and gold. Any comments on verse 13? I don't, want to give, I don't want to give us an unbalanced view here. Again, God calls us to live our lives out for Him. And He calls us to live them out in this country right now, working for a living, owning things, living in homes. The Corinthians focused on that. The focus wasn't on conciliating, entreating, preaching the gospel, living the gospel. Their focus was on hiding it as much as possible so we don't lose our position, so we don't lose ourselves. 
Living for, living for Christ can have, can and will have repercussions. In some places, it will mean a beheading. In others, it may not mean a raise. It's still repercussions. And now I'm, we'll finish up with this. Do, do these sound like things that the Corinthians should be ashamed of? I thought they did all along. And then I read this verse, verse 14. I do not write these things to shame you, Paul says, but to admonish you as my beloved children. No matter how harsh, hard, or biting, or sarcastic this may have sounded to us, Paul was not trying to shame the Corinthians, although I think if they were really paying attention and saw just how far they had fallen, they couldn't help but be somewhat ashamed. He was trying to admonish or warn them. The word admonish comes from the Greek word meaning to put someone in mind of something, to help them see something. Paul knew this group of Corinthian believers, and he knew what would get to them. More than that, the Holy Spirit certainly knew how to communicate to them in a manner that they would hear. Paul considered the Corinthians, he says, as beloved children. He, doesn't, he calls them his beloved children. The word beloved comes from the very same Greek word, as you probably guessed, from where we get the, Greek, the word love, and it is the agape love word. Uh, Paul's love for them knew no bounds. He would do whatever was necessary, as much as was possible, for him to bring them around and to bring them back to the gospel, back to the word of God, back to service for the king. Remember, all the things he did, he did, he did as he said in 2 Corinthians, after this, he was shipwrecked, he was beaten, he was stoned, he was whipped. He was in danger from rivers, rob, rivers, robbers, countrymen, Gentiles, cities, wilderness, the sea, false brethren. He spent sleepless nights. And one of the things that plagued him the most, plagued is the wrong word, that concerned him the most, was the daily pressure of concern for all the churches. This was what his concern was, was for these people. He loved them. He cared for them. He delighted in them. And so, many of us have children. Some of us know what it's like when those children go astray. Don't picture Paul here grinning and pumping his fist as he, as he dictates this to his amanuensis. He was not delighted over his turn of phrase. No, rather picture him pacing, scratching his head, stroking his chin, scowling, smiling, thinking, furrowed brow, saddened features, trying to put together a letter that will, that will bring his beloved children home. He likely dictated, as I said, this to Emanuensis. Imagine the patience that this secretary must have had while Paul worked through this lengthy corrective. He didn't want to be harsh, but neither did he want to be soft. And he talks about that later on. Do you want me to come to you with a whip or with love? He was willing to do whatever was necessary. Imagine that patience. This wasn't a group of people who couldn't agree on a color for the rugs in their church. This these were Christians who were rapidly going the way of the world. They were factionalized, haughty, prideful, arrogant, and probably petulant brats in some ways. Their behavior had become a stigma to the church, but Paul loved them, and he wanted to correct them, just as a father wants his prodigal to return home. Later in 2 Corinthians, and we'll, we'll, later in 2 Corinthians, Paul says this, Here for this third time I am ready to come to you, and I will not be a burden to you, for I do not seek what is yours, but you. For children are not responsible to save up for their parents, but parents for their children. I will most gladly spend and be expended for your souls. If I love you more, am I to be loved less? Sometimes love has to be difficult and tough, but he loved them. And then to the Thessalonians, he said in the same way, just as you know how we were exhorting and encouraging and imploring each one of you as a father with his own children. If you have any spiritual responsibility over someone, whether they are your child or someone that you are responsible for bringing to the Lord by God's grace, there may be times when you will have to admonish them. The word admonish comes from the Greek word again, which means to put someone in mind of something. This is not a provoking, unkind, or sarcastic blast, but a scriptural corrective applied in love and humility after much prayer. The, the saying, there but for the grace of God go I, is so very true in all of our lives. In all of our lives. Are you willing to be spent and expended for others? Will you exhort, encourage, and implore rather than scold, humiliate, and self-righteously judge? This is what Paul was trying to do with his beloved Corinthians. 
And then, in kind of in preparation for next week, is, well, no, I'm going to be gone next week. Are you going to be teaching next week? Jess is going to be teaching next week. Yay. Do I actually have a teacher up here? This is what Paul was trying to do with his beloved Christians. He, he begins to assert, to reassert, continue to assert, I guess I should say, his apostolic authority over this church by referring to them as his beloved children. And then in the next verse, he expands on that. The point Paul is making, what father in here wouldn't do whatever was necessary to help his child? Sometimes that means giving them money. Sometimes that means withholding money. Sometimes that means correcting them. Sometimes that means encouraging them. Sometimes that means admonishing them. Sometimes that means getting into the ditch with them. Does it not? And what father, what loving father wouldn't do any of that to help his, his son or his daughter? He would. He just would. And that's what Paul is trying to communicate here. The relationship that he had with the Corinthians was one, a special relationship. One that he had uh, with the churches that he founded, the many churches that he founded. And he says, and I'm going to just finish with this in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 15, reading it again. I, he says, will most gladly spend and be expended for your souls. He's talking to people that are saved. Now, there's some in the church, of course, that probably aren't. But he's talking to people who, 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 are, who are born again. I will gladly spend and most gladly spend and be expended for your soul. That's what God is calling us to do, especially with one another, is to spend and be expended for one another. To be to each other what God has called us to be. And if that includes giving up things, then so be it. We need to give them up. If it doesn't include giving up things, fine. Be grateful and joyful that God has not called you to do that. But the end result and the most important thing is that He gets all the glory. Because without the Holy Spirit, none of it would be possible. And so that's what Paul wants to make sure the Corinthians know. Let's pray. Lord, we thank You that Your grace is so all-encompassing, so perfect, so unbelievable. It, it is what, it is how you have brought us to yourself, kept us to yourself, and moved us along step by step, grace to grace, growing in the Lord Jesus Christ day by day. Might we use that as our example, not that we have the grace, but that we can benefit by it to spend ourselves on others. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for listening to the latest podcast from Kootenai Church. If you'd like to learn more about Kootenai Church or to donate to our church ministry, you can do so online by visiting KootenyChurch.org. We hope you enjoyed this podcast and pray you'll join us again next time. Once again, thank you for listening.